Welcome everybody to the session about uh, logging and best practices. We're really happy to be here at KubeCon. Um, I don't know how many times we have been here, but really happy to share what's new and how you can deal with scalability problems. Today we were going to try to do a more hands-on session, more than just going through slides. So I know we're going to get a lot of Q&A. We will try to fit all the Q&A during the session. But if we don't have enough time, we just go out of the room. We can be there for an hour talking about best practices, issues, or everything that uh, you need to solve. So feel free to just raise your hand uh, at the end of the talk or just talk to us at the end. And as I said, uh, we got access to an and the early version of the Fluent Bitbook for Kubernetes. So just scan the QR code, fill up the form if you want to get access to it. So we will start talking about the challenges that we got in logging. And the main purpose of logging is not to do logging or extract data, actually it's just do data analysis. But if you want to do data analysis, you need to extract the information for that gives you the relevant insights for what's going on in applications or services. And with this, I'm talking from the kernel to user space applications, containers, and everything that you have in the middle. And when you got an issue and you want to troubleshoot things, yeah, everybody asks, hey, we are the logs, give us the logs. But sometimes having more logs doesn't give you more value, right? Actually, more telemetry data sometimes can add a lot of noise which re makes it really hard to get or extract the insights from your environment. Services write logging information to different places and usually in different formats. For example, Nginx has the access log. Well, you can configure that for different type of virtual host in different type of paths, while other applications prefer to use the syslog system where those syslog messages might end up in a different location. But as you can see, the content is quite different. And if you're a lovely user of Windows, you might end up with the events uh, in a different place that can be only accessed by through some weird API through the system. And I say weird because it's really complex to do it. Okay, and login is, doesn't, we don't talk about just the file system. Log information can exist anywhere. And it could be, yeah, bar log messages, bar log containers, but also if you want to read the login information from the kernel, you want to open the, the, kernel, the kernel messages device, which is like a pseudo file, or maybe you want to read some a terminal serial interface to collect data from. Even if you are using a running some embedded Linux environment or you're playing with a constrained environment devices, you need to collect the information from different places. Um, if your application is just connecting to system D or to journal D, journal D also exposes its own way to consume and read the data from there. And also the information around logging exists not just inside the same machine, but also in remote endpoints. If you think about Kubernetes, you have a distributed system and you want to access the Kubernetes events, likely you need to go and connect to the API server, which is a remote machine, which is not a local service inside your node. And same as you go to pull for information for logs, sometimes you open up a TCP port or UDP port to receive syslog messages or others. So you might guess that having all this information in different formats from different sources dealing with local services and remote endpoints gets really complex because at the end of the day, you have to deal with all of that at the same time. You just cannot rely on a single file. Right? And, and if you're doing in this space, logging for a while, you might understand what I'm trying to refer. But your final goal is always to do data analysis, right? Don't forget the goal. Nobody wake up in the morning. I always say this, oh, I'm going to do logging. I'm going to do metrics. No, you don't care about that. Nobody likes it, but you have to do it. So the approach of do data analysis is gets hard when you face the truth. And you go here and see that different operating system, different ways to collect the, the information but your goal is to do data analysis. And at some point you start realizing that the data comes in what we call an instructor format. Yeah, you can understand that the first fraction of this web server log entry has an IP address because your brain has been trained to understand what is an IP address, right? Not to compute it, right? But you, you understand, and you understand that later you have a timestamp, then you have some HTTP components like request method, protocol version, status code, and so on. If you have an instructor log, 
and we don't have a real structure for the computer, this gets really complex to parse when you are processing thousands of thousands of messages per second. Ideally, you want to get something like this. I'm not talking about that JSON is the best structure. I'm not saying that. But I'm trying to say that you should have a notion for the computer that says this key equals this value. And you don't want to parse all the content over and over. But if your data comes in different formats in an unstructured way, how do you solve that problem at scale? Ideally, you want to do something like this. You take your unstructured data, you go through a parsing process that will give you a final structured version of the information. But most of the time, you're doing this. You're writing your custom script in a machine to extract specific information, and tomorrow you create a different scraper and a different scraper, and so on. And I know that people are laughing because everybody has been here on this place. Right? And then you ended up doing something like this, picking just one single database. Uh, there are many, right? And then you start putting more information in that database. You ended up paying a ton of money. And sometimes the information that you are sending to your database, because remember, you want to do data analysis, you're not querying all the information. Maybe you are consuming 20% of that information, and you are paying for the 100%. Yeah, if all of you are operators and you are not paying for the bills in your company, good, it's not your problem. But when you're going to ask for a rise, hey, we're spending so much in infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. If you make it cheaper, we can give you an rise next year. And, and it happens, right? So what is your strategy to deal with this, right? This doesn't scale. And everybody of us, sometimes we move companies, right? And then the next developer comes in, or the next operator, and need to solve the problem again, again, and again. Or the worst, you join a new company, and you have to fix the mess that exists already, right? And without a strategy, this gets really complex. So the login challenges, as a summary and a recap, is around different sources, different formats, different endpoints, and volume. Companies generate 20 to 30% more data every year. So what works today might not work the next year unless you have the right strategy to deal with all these components around uh, login. And this is where FluentBit comes in as a scalable solution that was started around 2014. FluentBit is from the FluentD family. FluentBit is a graduated project with the CNCF is read it in C language. Yeah, we're not going to debate today about Rust versus Golang versus XYZ, right? But it has a pluggable architecture. We have a more than 100 connectors between input sources destinations, and it's cross-platform. You can run it in Linux, Windows, Mac OS, BSD, and it's highly customizable, meaning like if you want to extend, not just move data, but if you want to do processing, and the features that we have to process the data in the middle is not enough for you, you can extend it by using Wasm, by using Lua, or Golang, which is quite powerful. And I'm proud to say that, yeah, it's a full vendor neutral project. It's something that is a project with a CNCF. It's not that a company will buy Fluentbit and Fluentbit will go away. It's not like that. Who contributes to Fluentbit? Amazon, Google, Oracle, Microsoft. They are couple of dozen of companies investing in general resources into make Fluentbit even better. And Fluentbit is not just for logs. Today, Fluentbit handles logs, metrics, and traces. And I know you will get a ton of questions around this. But what I can tell you when you think about logs, in the Fluent world, logs, what we call is schema-less. We have a schema, but it's a schema-less, meaning that it's quite flexible to contain all the data that you can imagine. And we just, also we can manage binary data, not just a text format. And logs schema list is just a ton of key value pairs, such as JSON. But we use something called message pack internally. In the metrics world, yeah, this is a simplified version of our schema. We have, you know, we support different types for metrics like counters, gauges, histograms. We can have dimensions for labels. You can have the description, the value for metrics, and so on. And for traces, yeah, this is an even more simplified version. Actually, in the traces, we use this very similar structure than open telemetry. And everything that I'm saying here between logs, metrics, and traces is, are compatible 
in the world with Prometheus. They are compatible with OpenTelemetry. So that means that Fluentbit is a very versatile tool that just, you just can plug in your architecture and solve all the problems. And now I'm going to hang over the microphone and start talking about the main topic here, because I know that we are all suffering from logging and we're looking for best practices. So Anurag, please welcome to the stage. Okay, so we've now talked about the problem. How do we go about solving it? Uh, and really, when we think about how we're going to solve this, these logging problems, uh, these data problems, I like to think of it in, in three different buckets that we'll run through. So the first is processing, right? We're collecting all this information. And as we're collecting this information, we can do stuff with, uh, with all the information we're collecting as we do so. What's enrichment, reducing log volume, redaction, uh, conforming to a schema, make it more useful as we go and, and search or do data analysis. Uh, and, and even, you know, sometimes we just don't need to deal with logs. Let's convert that to, to, to metrics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some architectures, right? So Fluent Bid and how you can collect that data. We'll talk a little bit about how you can pair that up with some Hotel SDK, Hotel Collector, all of the good stuff that's within the CNCF family. Uh, and then last, we'll, we'll run through some of the monitoring and operation side of logging, right? There's a ton of information going through. We want to make sure that it, it runs um, as, as needed. So uh, what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and switch my screen. And what we'll do is walk through a couple of examples here. So, awesome. So first, we'll walk through a uh, first example. And this example, uh, everything here is in, in FluentBit. We're going to be generating a message. So think of it as I'm logging something that says hello world once per second. And what we're going to uh, end up doing here is do some enrichment. So why is this useful, right? Many times logs can uh, miss a bunch of information that, that might be relevant for someone debugging. Especially in a containerized world, we might have 50 logs that look exactly the same. We might have 50 versions of the app running. And without understanding where it's running, how it's running, what host it's running on, uh, that information might, uh, get, it might be really hard to figure out and pinpoint what happened. So let's go ahead and run that configuration. And what we'll see is while we're running that hello world, we're also enriching that with hostname. So we've taken something from the machine, from the box, enriched the log. So from a best practices standpoint, sometimes it might feel counterintuitive, but we've got to add information to make things faster, right? Add some volume, add some additional structure to understand what's, what's going on. So next, let's go into the second example. And in the second example, we're going to take a very common use case, right? Someone accidentally turned on debug and trace, and all hell is breaking loose within the back end. It's, it's taken in that data like a champion, but it's also charging us for that data. And sometimes uh, best practices can involve, let's, let's, save, uh, let's save the data volume. Let's get rid of stuff that's not going to be useful. Let's make sure our queries run really quickly uh, so that way we're not uh, searching through, through a bunch of junk. And here what we have is a filter that says, if I find something that includes uh, um, info, um, I'm going to go ahead, or sorry, if I find something that says debug or info, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. So we're going to completely remove that log um, that's coming in from debug. And if we go and run this, now only the error are going to show up, right? So a very simple example of now we have a ton of stuff coming in, best practices. We don't have to just collect everything, uh, you know, uh, star all. We can, we can really go and filter it as we collect it. Why not? So next, let's go into our third example. Oops, almost uh, gave it away there. And this is doing a little bit of business logic or processing as the log is being generated. So this is my credit card number. Uh, you can take a picture what whatnot. But <laughs> as we want to go and show this to, to the whole session, what we're going to do is process it out. Let's redact it. Um, so traditionally, when we're doing logging, there can be times where we have sensitive information. 
And if we are collecting that sensitive information and it's routing and it's going to get highly available with 29s of availability, well, shoot, it's going to be really hard to go delete that. So why don't we change the data itself, keep the structure, but redact it uh, in place? So this is another best practice where, hey, we're, we've got this information. It contains a lot of vital stuff, but we don't necessarily need to collect that or store that in, in a highly redundant environment. Now, um, another one that's, that's really great to see is logs to metrics. And what this is, is logs contain a ton of information. And sometimes, as this, uh, this message kind of shows, it's, it's very, very heavy, right? I've got the namespace. I've got all this container stuff. And in the end, all I care about, all I care about as an operator is how many times did this uh, dummy message actually show up. So sometimes the best way to handle a log is to just convert it to a metric. Right. We've got alerting, we've got um, all sorts of processes that are built on top of this, and here we're going to export it so that we can query it with Prometheus Exporter. If we wanted, we could use OTEL and, and send it to OTEL metrics. So let's go ahead and run this. This is going to go ahead and run, and it's going to give us a count of all those messages. But let's forget the logs for a second and turn our attention to the right-hand side. And what we're doing is we're querying the Prometheus exporter endpoint. And as you can see, it's also incrementing the number of messages that show up, right? So all that stuff on the left-hand side, we don't care about any of it. We just want to know this number, 17, 15, whatever it uh, is at, at that time. So best practices in, in this sense is really how do we really just get rid of the log, get, get the information, extract the information that we want. Now, I'll, I'll run through this a little quickly because I think we have a, another demo that I think is really great within the operations zone of, of logging, which is architecture patterns. Um, and sometimes we feel we have to do every single thing within the place that we collect that information. But what's really fantastic about cloud native infrastructure, let me move this thing out of the way. Uh, what's really great about cloud native infrastructure is Right, we can chain these things together. We can collect logs on our servers, on our IoT devices, our MacBooks, whatever, fire that data up to a more centralized or uh, operationalized central place to go do that processing. And that can run our scripting, that can run our redaction, that can run our removal of those logs. And if for some reason we're getting terabytes and terabytes of data a day, we can scale that up. Right? We can scale it up using some of the hopefully good stuff you've learned at this conference bump the replicas up, uh, make, make sure everything runs in parallel. Uh, and, and you have a bunch of tools right, within the CNCF itself that work together um, you know, almost magically. So with that, let me go ahead and hand this off to uh, Lakaros, who will talk a little bit about the operational side of this. Thank you, Anna. OK, hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Uh, going to move to. Okay, so uh, when, when you're running in, in production your observability, uh, you would like to, to monitor certain aspect of it. You would like to see how your ingestion is going to your pipeline, how it is actually being processed and later being uh, sent out to your uh, output destinations. Uh, so uh, now what we're going to see is uh, how we can uh, detect and how can we handle some, uh, some particular common issues like uh, the errors that may occur when you are sending your data to your destination and how you can also uh, deal with the back pressure. Let's say that you are sending a lot of data and your endpoint is not capable of handling this amount of data that you're sending. Uh, the buffering uh, comes to the rescue to deal with this uh, back pressure. So uh, this is uh, an instance where we have uh, flow and bit running. Sorry. And we have uh, uh, an output uh, server here. This is uh, for benchmarking and demo purposes. It's just a simple uh, HTTP server written in Go. That will help us to, to see how uh, we're sending data. So around for a bit here and this 
This particular configuration is just sending uh, a dummy message to, to our endpoint. So this is uh, one of the uh, Grafana dashboard that we uh, usually uh, deploy to look into the full bit metrics. So as uh, Anurag showed before, uh, full bit exposes the metrics in an HTTP endpoint. This is a built-in HTTP server where you can grab uh, the metrics from full bit. On this case, we're using Prometheus to scrape those metrics, and then we are showing here in Grafana. Uh, as I said, this is very, very small uh, sample, just uh, sending one dummy message uh, per second. So you will see that it, it's pretty much uh, well behaving here, right? And nothing is wrong, everything looks good, a low number of connections, etc. So what, what happens if, uh, if your endpoint uh, goes down. Uh, we should start seeing immediately on FluentB that, that this is failing, right? It says that the endpoint is, is not available and some, uh, some chunks, which is the uh, basic uh, data structure that we use, uh, will, be, will be dropped. So we, we should see that we keep uh, ingesting data to our pipeline but we are no longer capable of sending uh, the data to the, to the endpoint. And if we start the endpoint again, yeah, we're good. If we start the endpoint again, we will see how uh, quickly Fluentbit will, will recover. And we don't need to go to the, to the actual log file of Fluentbit in this case to see that it's recovering. We will see that uh, pretty fast Fluentbit will get to, to a good pace uh, with, uh, with the output side. So what if we put a, a little bit more load here to, uh, to better see what's going on, right? To better see how Fluentbit is able to, to recover. So this will generate uh, a fair amount of load. Uh, this, is a, this is a small machine, so not that much. But with this load, if our endpoint goes down, we will uh, notice a, a lot of uh, warning messages that it could not send the, the data to, to the uh, output, right? And we will notice uh, that. But we already saw the errors there. But what if we don't have that much errors, but we have uh, like a delay in our endpoint? Um, okay, the input and output are pretty much the same now. Uh, let me show you some drop records we can identify here, but here input and output are pretty much the same, right? So what if my endpoint has some delay. So we're going to add some delay here. Come on. Okay, so our output is, is up, but it is introducing some delay. It's not that it's not responding, it's not that it's down, so there is no error in our uh, other metrics that we may have, but it's taking longer to, to reply back. So we can see that uh, this line that was pretty much the same a few moments ago, now the output is very low, right? Our endpoint is replying back, is receiving the data, but at a lower rate. We introduce some, some delay. So what can we do to, to deal with this? Well, we can have our file system used as a buffering mechanism. 
So when it starts failing, uh, it will save our chunks into the file system. It will use whatever space you define to be used there. And then it will try to resend uh, this, this data again. By default, we will only try, retry once, right? But you, if you're not allowed to lose any data, well, you have to configure a good amount of space for your, uh, your storage and also configure the retry limit either to unlimited or to a higher number. And, and you will see that uh, Fluent Bit will keep retrying and until the number of retries uh, is uh, reached. Let's say you put there three retries, so you will have the first attempt and three more retries, and it will uh, not send it again. So uh, now that these numbers are pretty, pretty uh, far away, right? Uh, we could restart the output server and see how it will quickly recover. And, and get to, to a better pace of sending the data to your, to your output. We have to uh, take into consideration that some of those were dropped because uh, we defined to only retry once, which is the default. Okay, drop records. Okay, and now we can see this was the input line, right? And the output, you can see that as soon as the, the endpoint become available again and was not uh, showing any delay on replying back with, uh, to our request, uh, it recovers immediately, right? So depending on if you're allowed to lose data, if you want to keep up with your latest records instead of just sending everything, you will have options to configure uh, the flow and bit. You will have options to deal with the back pressure from your outputs. And uh, yeah, that's it. Now back to Eduardo. Yeah. Thank you. Now, oh, we put this in a hiding mode. Okay, maybe I can, I can go through this by not uh, showing the content here. But let's talk about uh, on skip. There you go. One of the, one of the keys on FluentBit to deal with back pressure, uh, well, do, you know, do you understand the concept of back pressure, right? Even in your house, right? If you have a pipe, you have water flowing through it, at some point, if you put more water, the water will not flow faster because the pipe has a capacity. The same happens in computers. Everything is buffering your pipes, right? So if you have more data, right, doesn't mean that the data will flow faster. And at some point, maybe your pipe should be, could be really, really fast. But when you're sending that water or that data, the remote endpoint might not be able to receive at the speed that you are sending the data. Example, you have 100 nodes sending data to one endpoint. Example, Elasticsearch. And now you want to do 200 nodes sending the same amount of data to that endpoint. It might not work. Indexing will delay, it will add back pressure, you cannot start processing the data, and you start accumulating. And this is where buffering comes in. Buffering is the capacity to store the data in a very efficient and safety way. So if you cannot del deliver the data fast enough, at least you can keep the state. And if the agent fails or your machine gets restarted, you can recover and your data can be reprocessed when it's time to go. By default, Fluent Bit use a, a memory buffering. But now we have something that is a, well, everybody in production does this, right? Everybody in production what does enable the, what we call the hybrid system, what is called file system buffering. If you are familiar with memory mapped files or if you are familiar with databases, there are very efficient ways to store the data into the file system that are really cheap from 
from a system calls perspective. Normally, when you open, read, uh, open, close, or read a file, you do a system call to open, to read, then to write, then to close the file system, right? You invoke four system calls. But when you're processing data at this scale, invoking all the system calls is really, really expensive. And that's why we need another mechanism that can deal with file system, but it's cheap, and this is memory mapped files. And memory mapped files allow us to open a file and do kind of a, a mirror of the content of that file right away in memory. So we can reduce the number of system calls involved to read or write content. And the other thing is like, if you're using, and we were this, giving this example yesterday, it's like, if you're using just memory buffering, maybe you can tell me what would happen if I have back pressure and I'm just accumulating data in memory, what happens? Run out of memory, what that means? Process stop. Well, the kernel will kill you, that's it. <laughs> it will not let you eat all the memory that you have in the system because your process start accumulating data because this data, you cannot flash it away, right? And this is back pressure. If you're just using memory, that will happen. But if you use file system, which is the, everybody in production uses Microsoft, Google, Oracle, use this mechanism enable, what they do is they create the chunks in memory, but they have a reflection in the file system. And at some point, if they face back pressure, right, and your memory is going up, you can set a limit. For example, I don't want to use more than 500 megabytes. And when you hit this limit, all the chunks are, are up in memory. We have this concept of up and down, right? All the chunks that are not being used but are up in memory will go to a down state in a very safety way. So, of course, everybody has more storage than memory. So you can assign a couple of terabytes for this. And even if your endpoint is down for hours, your data will be safe. And you can deal with back pressure. But if you don't enable this, yes, you might get some, some troubles. Right? So a, a couple of best practices that we were talking about today the first one was, and Rick was mentioned about processing the data. You don't need all the data that you are collecting. Deal with that. You don't need anything. It's not like at home, right? Oh, we will save this for later. No, it doesn't work that for data because you pay for that, right? And the other, there's ways to exclude data based on patterns. You can process the data before you send it out, right? It will be cheaper. And the other aspect is always monitoring. It's not about to just run the agent and let the data flow. Hey, are we facing latency? Are we facing back pressure? Because if you notice that you're facing back pressure, hey, you might consider to add more storage to the pipeline, right? Because you want to be more resilient. And there's one thing. Everybody prepares for things that works. But in this world of Kubernetes, cloud native, and moving data, you have to prepare for when things fail. What if you get a DNS issue? What if network goes down? Yeah, you are in the worst case scenario and you want to make sure to do the best to avoid uh, losing data. Okay, so maybe you have some, some minutes for Q&A. I would like to, I know the, the microphone is there, so if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer about back pressure, performance, login, open telemetry, metrics, anything that comes to your mind. Yeah, it's better if you go to the microphone, so then we get the recording of the question for, for people who are watching online. Hey, Brayden. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question about back pressure. Um, yeah. In terms of like back pressure strategy for like pausing input to make sure that you're not overloading while like your output is over limit or something like that. When you're in memory, the memory version, there's a membuff limit that if you're over that membuff limit, you can pause the the input will pause. Yeah. Um, that doesn't work for file system storage, and there is a close equivalent which is pausing on too many chunks open, so you can set your max chunks and then going open. But is there a possibility to introduce a concept where you can pause input on your output total limit size being over? Yeah, there's one option to pause the ingestion based on the storage limit that you assign it to an output plugin. 
It's called storage that paws on chunks limit, something like that. Uh, it, it, it looks like that's not based on the output total limit size. It looks like that based on the max chunks up configuration. It should be on the queue size, but let me check. Yeah, before you giving you a full yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. Right. because we're, we're trying to, I'm trying to nail that down and I can't figure it out. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Folks, and they just telling me in the back that we have to stop right now, but I'm happy to, or the team, happy to talk, answer all the questions in, in the back. Thank you so much.